Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We are ready to begin. Today's webinar is eligible for one contact hour. Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The speakers and planning committee members have disclosed no relevant financial relationships. To receive contact hours for this NCPD session, participants are required to attend the webinar and log into our LMS to complete an evaluation form. Information on how to access this will be emailed to all attendees approximately one week after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available via the Sigma repository within a few business days of recording. Following the presentation, we will have time for a question and answer session. You will see on your GoToWebinar control panel that you can send a message through the questions feature. This is where you can type in any question you'd like to pose to the presenter. Be sure to hit send so the message makes it to us. We would like to thank our speaker today for sharing her expertise with us. Our speaker today is Shen Yi Su. Shen Yi is a PhD candidate in nursing at the University of Hong Kong. She is a trained oncology nurse with extensive experience in nursing research involving cancer and palliative care. She has published over 10 peer-reviewed papers and presented her latest study, Advanced Directive and End-of-Life Care Preferences in Nursing Home Residents in Hong Kong and Taiwan at the International Nursing Research Congress in 2021. Now let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Linda, for the uh, introduction. Um, my name is Xing Yu Xu. It's uh, such an honor for me to be here uh, and present this uh, webinar. Um, today, we'll go over a very important topic um, in end-of-life care, uh, advanced care planning, or ACP. Um, ACP is a communication process that uh, guides decision making at the end of life. Um, so the learning outcomes of uh, today's uh, webinar is to describe uh, nurses' roles and uh, responsibilities in ACP and end of life communication from a global uh, perspective. Um, we'll also identify some potential approaches uh, to improve the practice of ACP uh, and end-of-life care. Oops, sorry. Um, sorry, give me one second. <laughs> Okay. Um, so uh, making decision uh, is a complex process and uh, it is particularly challenging uh, when we're making decisions with or for patients uh, who are near the end of uh, their life. So, uh, for example, here, the decision to uh, receive uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR. Um, so CPR is one of the uh, life-sustaining treatments that would potentially uh, prolong uh, patient survival. Um, however, in terminally ill patient, uh, the successful rate of, uh, the success rate of CPR is low, and on the other hand, uh, CPR can cause complications like rib fraction and uh, causing unnecessary pain and uh, suffering to the patient. So we can see here uh, attempting CPR is not always the right choice. So um, here I listed some other uh, life-sustaining treatments uh, and these are also possible medical decisions that uh, patients need to make uh, at the end of life. So, um, for example, uh, do they want to be put on a, a ventilator to support their breathing? Or 
um, do they even want things like artificial nutrition and hydration uh, when they can no longer eat or drink by themselves? So um, end of life decisions um, also include a question like uh, where the patient wish to be taken care of uh, and the, at the end of life. So um, is that place at home? Uh, is it in a hospital or is that a long term care facility like a nursing home? So uh, under the patient centered care framework, uh, individual state, uh, we have the autonomy uh, to make informed medical decisions. So uh, in other words, that uh, we have a say in uh, whether or not uh, that we want to receive certain type of medical treatments or to decide things like uh, where we wish to die. Um, how, however, the uh, majority of people have limited decision making capacity uh, in the last week of their life. Um, in these situations, uh, naturally, uh, our family members will uh, make decisions on our behalf. So um, our family might be living us from day to day or uh, spending a lot of time with us in the past, but do they really know um, how we wish to be taken care of? So uh, research uh, finding says not necessarily. Uh, so here's a uh, there's a one recent study that found that the consistency for uh, medical treatment preference are uh, between patients and their caregivers uh, was less than 50 percent. So. Uh, Communication is really the key here, and uh, it's important to have that communication early. Uh, well, patients do have that uh, mental capacity uh, to make their own decisions, but um, it's uh, easier said than done. Um, having that discussion can be very difficult. Uh, death and dying is a taboo topic in many cultures and uh, uh, the fact is that many of us have not had that uh, discussion with our family. So um, our, our research team uh, conducted a survey study uh, in nursing home residents. And we found that 80% uh, of them considered prolonging life not important um, in a given hypothetical dying scenario. Uh, but only 14 to 18% of the participants uh, reported having any sort of uh, end of life care discussions uh, with either the family members or uh, health professionals. So, this finding means that uh, it's very likely that the family do not know uh, the, uh, uh, the patient's wishes and it'll be very uh, hard for them uh, to make decisions on their behalf uh, in the future. So, so how do we improve this? Um, how do we as nurses uh, make sure patients uh, receive the care that they want? So um, advanced care planning or ACP is that process that uh, enables that uh, early and effective communication. Uh, so the definition of uh, ACP, uh, it is a process that supports adults at any age or stage of health uh, in understanding and sharing their personal values life goals and preferences uh, regarding future medical care. So here I give you a much briefer definition. It's uh, making decisions in advance. So uh, we're making decisions ahead of the medical event that might happen in the future. So um, ACP does not only make good intuitive sense. Um, there's also a lot of research evidence uh, demonstrating its clinical benefits. Um, for example, ACP increased the use of uh, hospice and palliative care. 
um, ACP decreased the use of uh, life-sustaining treatment and prevent uh, hospitalizations at the end of life. So, uh, of course, it will reduce healthcare costs that's uh, related to those treatments and hospitalizations. Um, so, ACP also reduced family distress, and I think importantly, it reduced nursing staff moral distress because providing unnecessary care can be uh, very distressing uh, to nurses and it can even lead to a sense of guilt or uh, uh, job dissatisfaction. So we talk about how uh, communication is uh, very important in ACP, uh, but the documentation of uh, these discussions that we have with patients uh, is equally important, um, especially when uh, it is medically needed. Um, uh, these documents uh, become essential tools uh, to make sure patients receive the care they want. So, um, ACP discussions uh, generally lead to three types of uh, documents. Um, the first one is advanced statement. So uh, it's a statement of uh, patients' wishes and preferences um, uh, for medical care. So uh, these documents are uh, sometimes not legally binding, uh, but can still help us to identify treatments that will uh, align with uh, patients' values and their goals. Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, advanced statement is uh, recorded in a form of workbook. Um, and here I'm showing you an example of uh, ACP National Workbook from Canada. And these are also uh, great questions that we can ask patients to better understand them. So, uh, for example, uh, what do they value the most uh, in terms of their mental and physical health? Um, is it being able to live independently, uh, being able to recognize others, being able to communicate with people around them, or uh, what, are, uh, what are some things that will make prolonging life unacceptable for them? So not being able to communicate with people around them or being kept alive with uh, machines but with no real ch uh, chance of survival or not having control of their uh, bodily function. Um, some more examples. Um, so, what when they uh, when they think about death, um, what are the things they worry about? So, um, is there is that like experiencing certain symptoms? Uh, is that being alone? Uh, is it uh, they're afraid of losing their dignity? So, uh, so how what can we do to make the end more peaceful for them? So, a lot of people like to have friends and family around. Um, or dying in a more familiar environment, like at home, or having certain uh, spiritual rituals uh, being performed. So uh, do they have any uh, spiritual or religious beliefs that would affect their care uh, at the end of life? Um, so for example, nearly all uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, refuse blood transfusion. So that is definitely something we need to clarify with the patient and uh, record that in the medical record. Um, okay, so the second output uh, from ACP is advanced, uh, advanced decisions to refuse treatments. Um, and sometimes it's also referred to as uh, advanced directive or AD. So AD uh, provide informed consent uh, to the refusal of uh, certain medical treatments uh, at the end of life. So uh, these documents are generally uh, legally binding. So here I'm showing you a uh, example of advanced directive in Hong Kong. So um, in the blue blue box that I highlighted there, um, the individual would state that I shall now be given the uh, certain uh, life-sustaining treatments 
uh, under three conditions. So um, if they're uh, terminally ill, uh, if they're in a, a persistent uh, vegetative state or state of irreversible coma. Uh, so third one is some other uh, end stage condition that uh, the individual will uh, fill in the form and uh, uh, specify what, what that condition is. Okay, so uh, in Hong Kong, the AD form uh, must be signed uh, by the patient and two other witnesses. Uh, one of them must be a, a medical uh, practitioner in Hong Kong so that they know the, the form is valid and is uh, filled in uh, appropriately. Uh, neither witness should have an interest uh, in the estate of the person making the AD uh, to avoid any conflict, uh, uh, conflict of, uh, of interest. So uh, the example I just showed you is AD in Hong Kong, uh, but AD in other countries uh, uh, also include similar information. Uh, but across the globe, actually, there's many uh, different different degrees of regulation concerning AD. So of the uh, well-regulated jurisdictions, um, the regulations of AD is commonly included within a broader piece of uh, legislation. So uh, Hong Kong is actually among uh, the countries or regions that uh, where AD is semi-regulated. So uh, uh, in these uh, places, uh, regulation typically take a broader form, uh, sometimes in the form of guidelines. And uh, there are also many countries uh, without any formal AD laws or regulations. So even in the countries where AD um, uh, is uh, well regulated or semi regulated, uh, the completion rate of it uh, remain low worldwide with a high variability in different countries. So, um, US as uh, the earliest promoter of AD have uh, has amongst the highest AD completion rate in the world. Um, so over one third um, of the adult population in the US uh, had made ADs. Um, in most uh, Western European countries, that prevalence rate is around uh, 10 to 20 percent. Uh, and we can see here the prevalence is much lower in Hong Kong, uh, only 0.5 percent. And uh, this shows there is still a lot of room for improvement, a lot of room for uh, improving that AD uptake. Okay, so uh, now let's talk about the third output uh, from ACP. Uh, that's the nomination of a proxy decision maker. Uh, sometimes it's also called a uh, surrogate decision maker or a uh, healthcare uh, durable power of uh, attorney. So what is a, a proxy decision maker? Uh, a proxy uh, decision maker is a person that, excuse me, <laughs> uh, the person the individual choose in advance uh, to make health decisions um, for them when they are no longer uh, able to speak for themselves. So the proxy can agree to or uh, refuse or even withdraw treatment on the patient's behalf. Um, here are lists of some tips on how to help the patient to uh, choose the right proxy. So a proxy should be someone the patient trusts. Um, a proxy should be willing to take up that responsibility and um, uh, they're able to make potentially very difficult uh, medical decisions uh, for the patient. So obviously patients' uh, values, their goals, their preferences uh, should be communicated uh, to the proxy uh, because the better the proxy uh, know about the patient, the, uh, the, the more likely they'll make the type of decision that uh, the, uh, the patient would make if they could. 
So uh, we also need to verify that they understand their role and uh, don't forget to uh, inform other family and friends uh, of patients' wishes and their decision to uh, prevent any conflicts in the future. So, so who and when um, should we implement ACP? Uh, if we go back to the definition, uh, ACP is a process that supports adults uh, at any age or stage of health. So uh, frankly, everyone should start uh, a conversation and consider a uh, ACP plan, regardless of uh, your age or health. But ACP become particularly important um, when a patient has following conditions. So uh, if they have a life-limiting illness, um, if they have an advanced chronic illness, uh, if they're at risk of dementia or any anticipated deterioration uh, that may result in the uh, future loss of mental capacity. Um, now we identify the patients who are more in need of ACP. Um, still, a lot of people are not ready to start one right away or start one on their own. Um, so it's important for uh, uh, health professionals uh, to step in and uh, to guide and uh, facilitate this process. So uh, nurses are very well positioned to initiate and facilitate ACP. Um, first of all, we have a uh, we already have a good understanding of patients' physical and mental health. Um, we have the most frequent and regular contact uh, with patients and family members. So we probably already have that trusting relationship with them. Um, and uh, nurses are already acting as a facilitator uh, in the healthcare team and serve as a bridge of communication uh, between the team and the, fam uh, and the patient and their family. So what are nurses' uh, uh, roles and uh, responsibilities in ACP? I think there are three major roles. Um, the first one as an educator, um, second one as a facilitator, and uh, third one as an advocator. Um, and uh, now we'll look into each role uh, in detail. Um, so first, let's uh, talk about uh, patient education. Um, so one of the biggest barriers uh, to ACP is the lack of awareness. Um, a lot of people, they're not aware that they can even have this type of uh, discussions. Um, but because uh, talking about death and dying can be out of uh, social norms, uh, we probably can't just read off uh, the definition of ACP like what I did as patient education. Um, so how do we approach and uh, communicate this topic in a sensitive but effective way? Um, so now we'll talk about some uh, some of the communication uh, skills uh, when introducing ACP to patients. Um, as, uh, so a very essential part of communication is not how we talk, but how we listen. Um, as healthcare workers, uh, we might have the tendency to see ACP as just another task uh, to check off on and uh, solely focus on the documentation and implementation side of things. Uh, but instead, we need to pay more attention uh, to the considering, contemplating, and discussing um, side of conversation. Uh, this means we need to practice uh, empathetic listening. Uh, we also need to learn to uh, provide a, a non-judgmental space uh, for the patient uh, so they can uh, express themselves freely and uh, express their concerns uh, or fears. Um, so here I listed some do's and don'ts. 
in ACP communication. So let's uh, first start with the do's. Um, so do ask open questions. Um, open questions allow patients to uh, give information in their own way. So uh, for example, uh, we can ask uh, things like, uh, can you tell me how things are for you uh, in the past few weeks? Um, do ask questions with a psychological focus. Uh, during our routine work, we uh, might be more focusing on the phys uh, physical side of things. And, um, but that can prevent us from really going deeper into like the more sensitive uh, side of things. Um, so for example, we can ask, uh, what are your feelings about being admitted into the hospital? Uh, do summarize. Uh, at intervals at, at the end of a uh, conversation to check that if what we understand uh, is uh, what the patient actually meant. Uh, so do take health literacy of patients into account. I think this goes with any type of uh, patient education that uh, we need to catch ourselves when we're using uh, medical jargons or difficult language um, and instead use more uh, patient-centered language and uh, use language that is simple yet still meaningful. Um, do talk about death and dying in a, a culturally sensitive manner. Um, so, for example, we can observe how patients talk about their own death and um, we want kind of mirroring that and like adjust to their communication style accordingly. So what are some of the uh, don'ts? Um, so uh, do not ask leading questions. So the question might sound like, uh, you seem to be doing very well, aren't you? So uh, these type of question can discourage patients, excuse me, from giving an honest response. Uh, don't overly encourage patients to uh, look on the bright side or keep positive. Uh, these statements can be helpful at times, um, but it might also be counterproductive if it uh, stops patients from uh, discussing their concerns. So here I am giving you one bad example and a few good examples of uh, how to start, how to initiate a ACP conversation. So Ms. So-and-so, uh, we must talk about your uh, advanced care planning. So first off, it's not patient-centered. Uh, really sound like you have uh, something on your agenda that you need to finish. Um, it is very blunt and it used uh, jargon that a uh, patient might not uh, understand. So instead we can open the conversation with, um, uh, now that we have discussed uh, your pain, I wonder if there, uh, there was anything else you want to talk about. So this is an open question and uh, it really encourage uh, patients to uh, express themselves. Um, or if we wanna be more direct about it, uh, we can say, um, I wonder if we can discuss what might happen in the future or um, I have been wondering if we could talk about uh, if your illness got worse. Um, here are a couple more examples of uh, the questions we can ask when introducing patients uh, to the concept of ACP. Um, remember that we always, always start with uh, patients' values and their goals, uh, not specific uh, medical interventions. So uh, prognosis, I. Uh, so this is another uh, essential um, uh, patient education topic uh, is to help patients understand uh, their disease prognosis. Uh, research, uh, research shows that um, patients with an adequate understanding of their prognosis, uh, they'll have more, uh, worse pain and anxiety uh, at the end of life. So uh, even though doctors are generally the one to uh, break the news to the patient, 
uh, nurses do have that uh, have the responsibility to make sure to check that uh, if patients truly understand. So uh, we can ask question. Uh, we can answer question as appropriate. Um, uh, if there's a question we uh, can't answer, or if uh, we realize there's misunderstanding going on, uh, definitely relay that information uh, to the doctor and work with them to uh, make sure patients have a clear understanding. Um, we should also assess that uh, the patient know their options uh, going forward. Um, and that they know the risks and benefits associated with each option um, so that they can make a truly uh, informed and educated decision. Um, they might also want to know about their disease trajectory or some of the possible end-of-life decisions uh, associated uh, with a specific uh, disease. Uh, it's important to note that um, Diagnosis should never be forced upon the patient. Uh, even though uh, most patients do want to know about uh, their diagnosis, uh, some of them do not. Um, so another topic uh, that we can educate uh, patient and their family on is uh, some of the physical signs and symptoms uh, of approaching death. Um, I think teaching this can help them have a better understanding uh, of the natural uh, dying process and um, might also help them to understand the rationale uh, behind uh, withholding or withdrawing certain uh, medical treatments. So, uh, for example, uh, artificial nutrition and hydration it's, uh, has been the center ethical issue in end-of-life care. Um, but the fact is that uh, patients will have uh, decreased need for food uh, and uh, for drink because the body will naturally um, start to conserve energy and forcing more food uh, than the body wants uh, can cause pain, can cause obstruction, and can cause uh, unnecessary suffering to the patient. And with that knowledge in mind, um, the uh, the patient or their family uh, might think of their decision differently. So one more um, uh, patient education topic, I think it's uh, palliative care. Um, it can be a common myth that palliative care is seen as uh, like a loss of hope to the patient. Um, some people think it's, uh, palliative care patients are just waiting uh, to die, which is very far from the truth. Uh, there are always things can be done to improve patient and their family's quality of life. Um, so palliative care is the uh, holistic care um, that focus on providing patient relief uh, from pain and other symptoms uh, of their illness. Uh, it also address their physical, social, and spiritual needs. Um, so some patients might uh, even receive palliative care um, along with treatment that intended to cure uh, their serious illness. Okay, so let's go into the second section, uh, facilitating ACP. So in this section, I'll uh, introduce you to some real life examples of uh, uh, nurse led ACP programs. So um, the first one I'm showing you here is a nurse led multidisciplinary uh, intervention. So this is a, a randomized control uh, study that is published this year on JAMA uh, internal medicine. So uh, this, uh, this intervention is uh, consisted of two parts. So the first part is a telephone ACP pre-visit uh, with the nurse navigator. And the second part is an in-person visit uh, with their uh, with patients surrogate decision maker and patients uh, primary care provider. So 
So uh, during the uh, the phone pre visit, um, the nurse navigator uh, would discuss with patient about uh, things like why ACP is important uh, and other major component uh, in ACP, uh, such as excuse me, <laughs> such as their goals um, and values. Um, their preferred location of death, uh, and the naming of a, a surrogate decision maker. So at the end of the phone call, the uh, nurse navigator uh, will schedule, uh, schedule that in-person visit and uh, additional information, uh, including an ACP packet and a copy of uh, advanced directive will be uh, delivered to patient via mail. Um, so actually the in-person visit is uh, scheduled during patient's uh, annual uh, wellness visit. So um, I want to say here that lack of time is another reason that uh, prevents uh, ACP. And it's important to incorporate uh, ACP into the existing workflow. So in this case, um, patient and the provider, they uh, will already be meeting for this uh, annual checkup. So it's a, it's a very uh, practical time um, for both parties to have this uh, ACP me uh, meeting. So uh, for the in-person visit, the, uh, the provider will go over additional topics that uh, were not covered uh, by the nurse navigator. So, for example, the disease prognosis, uh, advanced directive, and uh, certain life uh, sustaining treatments. Okay, um, so this uh, study had uh, uh, found that the nurse-led ACP program uh, resulted in, in a significantly higher rate of ACP documentation uh, compared to the usual care group. So we can see here is over 40% in the intervention group and only 3.7% uh, uh, in the usual care control. So the study found that the nurse-led pre-visit uh, really op optimized the time spent with the uh, primary care provider. And as a result, uh, primary care providers, they were able to focus on the more uh, technical side of things like disease understanding and uh, prognostic uh, awareness. So this is a very good team-based uh, example that you or your um, institution can take reference from when designing an ACP program. Um, the next uh, the next ACP program um, I'm going to show you is called Let Me Talk, uh, which took a more culturally sensitive approach and uh, uh, it was implemented uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, in Chinese culture, um, patients might be reluctant uh, to discuss ACP. And to overcome that barrier, the uh, researchers, uh, they invite patient to share and review their uh, life experience. So basically they're doing a life review together uh, and to prepare patients uh, for having end of life discussions. Um, so this program uh, consists of uh, three weekly home visits um, and uh, each visit there is a different theme. Um, so the first one is called My Stories. Um, patient will share their experience, uh, experience of the illness. And on the second one, my views, uh, they'll, reflect, um, they'll reflect on their uh, personal values and belief uh, based on their life experience. And finally, the third one, uh, the nurse will help patient to uh, navigate some of the con uh, some of the issue concerning end of life care and help them to clarify their preferences. So at the end of the program, the um, nurse will uh, document these decisions in a, a personal workbook and uh, arrange an AD appointment for the patient uh, if that's needed. Uh, 
Um, this study also showed a lot of promising outcomes. Um, so at the six months follow up, the intervention group, um, they have the greater increase in diet consistency uh, of various uh, uh, end of life care preferences. And they also had a higher rate of uh, AD completion. So in cultures where uh, talking about AD or uh, sorry, talking about ACP or end of life care, um, is challenging. Um, this let me talk program structure uh, can be really it can really be a good way for um, nurses to break the ice and um, um, overcome that barrier that like uh, they're not familiar with the topic and uh, they initially do not want to uh, touch on this topic. Um, so here I'm showing you another uh, very uh, innovative way to introduce ACP. So it's called a, this is an end of life uh, conversation card game. So it's called Hello. Uh, and all the cards, there are uh, a lot of different questions that's related to ACP. And the answer will typically prompt a free flowing uh, conversations. So uh, in Hong Kong, the uh, JCC, uh, JCCC project, uh, they developed the local version of um, the communication game in both Chinese and English. And it's a really fun way to uh, start ACP discussion in the, uh, in the group setting. So virtual reality. Um, um, virtual reality or VR um, has also been adopted in promoting ACP. So in this particular study, um, um, uh, participants are invited to uh, watch a six minute uh, VR video, uh, which showed a, a first person perspective uh, of someone with COPD. So um, they have a very, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the users had a very immersive experience of a typical end of life um, journey from being admitted into the ICU uh, to withdrawing life sustaining treatment uh, to receive uh, hospice care. Uh, the study found that uh, VR videos can be a good decision uh, tool for ACP. So it helped the users to have a better understanding of uh, medical scenarios um, and also uh, help them to clarify their own preferences. So um, even though this study is uh, used more in the general population, not the uh, critically ill or um, end of life uh, patient population, uh, I think this intervention can still uh, inspire us to um, think of more ways on uh, how to incorporate uh, new technologies uh, into ACP. So now let's go into the uh, last section. Uh, so nursing advocacy. So I'll talk about it both uh, on a personal, uh, on an individual level and on a uh, higher level that's uh, institutional or national. So uh, what are the things we can do to better advocate for patients? So uh, this we already mentioned that we uh, want to clarify information, um, not only given by the um, physician, uh, any medical information that's provided to them, we want to make sure that they uh, clearly understand. Um, the second one is uh, uh, to speak up when uh, patient's uh, advanced directive is not being respected. So we definitely need to um, use our voice and advocate for uh, patient's rights. Uh, we also need to support patient's decision. So we need to support patient's decision, but what if the decision is that they prefer aggressive treatments uh, even when the survival rate is relatively low, uh, do we su still support that decision? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, supporting these decisions uh, is important too. Um, so, uh, but we, we shouldn't just stop there. Uh, we might want to explore further of what that, what that request means and uh, what is 
behind when they say, oh, I want everything possible done. So what is, what, what's really, what does that really mean? Um, sometimes it might be because they, they're in denial. Um, maybe they have unrealistic goals. Um, their fear of dying or um, fear of losing self-control um, can also be sense of false hope um, or a sense of uh, familial duty. So um, understanding uh, these reasons uh, behind their decisions can help us better communicate to them and uh, uh, help us to better advocate uh, for the patient. Yeah. So what can we do beyond an individual level? Um, so uh, there's still many barriers uh, to the implementation of ACP, uh, including legal and uh, political barriers. So uh, I think as nurses, there's still a lot that we can do. Um, we can engage in uh, different task force. Um, there's ACP uh, uh, committee locally. Uh, we can join those and um, to promote ACP policy development and even legislations. And on an institution level at your um, hospital, definitely use, again, use our voice and uh, action to improve the operation and management of ACP. So uh, that's about all the content I'm going to go over today. So just very quickly summarize what we talked about today. So. Um, uh, nurses' roles and responsibilities. Um, we want to um, initiate that conversation in a sensitive way with that communication skills that we talked about. Um, make sure they understand their prognosis and uh, even educate them on uh, things like the dying process uh, and palliative care. So as the ACP facilitator, um, we want to facilitate ACP uh, intervention uh, within the multidisciplinary team uh, and identify strategies that can uh, overcome barriers uh, in ACP and uh, end of life uh, communications. Uh, so we talk a, a, about a lot of strategies uh, today, including life re uh, review, um, having a conversation game, or even using technology like a, a VR video. So again, um, we, we, we do want to advocate um, for the patient's right, for their health, and for their safety. Uh, and also uh, to support uh, their decisions. Uh, and beyond the uh, individual level, we can also uh, advocate for a systemic change. So here I'm showing some uh, a useful resource uh, on ACP, and some of them are in many um, different languages. So uh, I hope you will find them helpful uh, in your clinical practice. Um, so that concludes my uh, uh, presentation, and now I will hand it over to Linda. Thank you so much for this wonderful information. I know it is very uh, appropriate for um, all nurses, no matter what type of field that we're in. We do have um, one comment here that I want to share with you. It can be difficult for staff to have these conversations when either patients are very afraid and also with COVID restrictions when patients are often in the hospital without family visiting them. The telephone option is very interesting. Have you seen that in your practice or uh, what have you seen in regards to COVID restrictions making it easier or more difficult when it comes to ACP? Definitely, definitely. Um, I didn't talk about this uh, in my uh, presentation, but uh, I think COVID definitely affect um, um, Palliative, uh, palliative care and things like uh, advanced care uh, planning a lot. So um, 
so one side uh, like really up the demand for it and um, I think through the pandemic we really realized that uh, things can change very rapidly even uh, even in uh, patients, uh, even in people who have no uh, pre-existing medical conditions. Uh, so, like again, I highlighted that um, ACP is very important uh, to have not during a crisis, but before any of that would happen. Um, another thing is that um, yes, during pandemic, there's uh, there's always the problem of uh, sh uh, short of staff. So um, that's uh, uh, that can like decrease um, the implementation of ACP and um, um, and also uh, just in general consultation on uh, palliative care. Um, so, but the good thing is I I I, I do see a lot of um, healthcare providers, nurses, and physicians uh, being very innovative. Um, so like the comments said, uh, uh, with telephone calls, and uh, I also see a lot of uh, uh, healthcare team, they're, uh, they're using video, they're using virtual conference, um, especially with those uh, uh, visiting uh, visitor restrictions. I, I know in even the nursing homes right now, it's still going on. And um, so, uh, really, the, the the staff are trying their best, so um, to to teach to either like teach the family, uh, teach the patient to uh, use uh, those conferencing calls, so they can kind of still be by their side um, at the end of life. And um, I this is not a personal experience, but uh, I know a lot of ICUs. Um, uh, are also doing the same thing. So uh, even though we're kind of, we can't have that touch, like can't uh, have that high touch uh, care uh, because of COVID, but still uh, I see a lot of people uh, thinking out of the box and uh, thinking about ways that uh, still to maintain that uh, quality of care that patient deserve uh, even at the end of life. Thank you for answering that. I, I agree, you know, being innovative in these difficult times is really challenging. So speaking of innovation, I do have a question in regards to the conversation card game. Um, is the intent for that to be used with the nurse and the patient and family, or is that for nurses in the education space? Um, Let me... I want to see if I can go back to that slide real quick because uh, I kind of rushed through it. Um, so uh, thank you for that question. Um, it's uh, really intended for, so it's, it's a question that's, uh, uh, so a, an example that I listed here. So um, so on the one card, it says, uh, in order to prov uh, provide you with the best care possible, uh, what three non-medical facts uh, should your doctor know about you? So uh, I think it's less about uh, being used among nurses. So it's, a, a, of course, a nurse can uh, lead this game, but uh, it can be uh, a group of patient or uh, patient and their family or even um, I know even even we can play this game with our family. Uh, so so it's it's I think it's really it can be a dinner thing um, of, uh, a more casual way to uh, start a conversation. Perfect. Thank you for answering that. Mm -hmm. In regards to, um, you know, having the conversation, one question we have is, how do you suggest handling when the patient wants an end of life plan and the family doesn't agree with the patient's plan? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank th yes, that, that is, um, that is not uncommon. Um, it's, uh, it can be very challenging, especially when they're, uh, when there is a uh, disagreement uh, even within the family or our family and the patient. Um, and I, I think 
along the same principle that we talked about, uh, do listen and uh, uh, understand. So what's their reason? Is there is there a reason behind um, behind uh, wanting end of life care or wanting more uh, aggressive care? So um, yes, it can be very tricky, and uh, um, I think in the within the hospital we. Uh, we have other resources that can support us. Um, so, for example, we can uh, involve a social worker in if they know the family dynamic better. Um, and there's maybe even ethics uh, committees uh, in the hospital can uh, get involved with the situation. So if the patient is still uh, mentally competent to uh, make their own decision, uh, so. Um, of course, we would uh, respect the uh, patient first. But if uh, the patient is not and there's uh, conflicts um, in the family, then so that, that's why we need proxy. So the patient decide ahead of time uh, who, will, who, will make, uh, who will have the say, who will make the decision for them. But um, if that's the situation, sometimes uh, we will have to resort to uh, next of kin. So uh, like legally, who's the one uh, uh, should make that medical decision. Great, thank you so much for answering that. You know, we're getting uh, close to time. So I do have one comment here. Um, they say this is a great presentation on ACP. I'm a nurse researcher focused on end of life care within the African context, very informative. However, it is an area we can look at soon within the African context. It is actually challenging when the doctor is the sole decision maker and do not involve nurses. So my question to you would be, uh, if people want to connect with you outside of the webinar, what is the best way for them to connect? It sounds like this would be a really good um, way for you guys to get together to discuss how to bridge those gaps and um, get the nurses involved. Yeah, uh, sh um, definitely. Um, I know um, even in Hong Kong, um, because the, uh, the uh, decision-making model can be different uh, from physician to physician, from patient to patient. So yeah, that's definitely something very interesting to uh, explore in research. Um, so Linda, we're asking if I can share the um, uh, my contact. Yeah. Do you um, do you want people to connect with you on social media? Maybe LinkedIn. Yeah, is, there, is there a way that I can type it in? Do I type it in the chat box? Um. Yep. You can type it in the chat okay. box to okay. all the entire audience. That would be fine. Um. To all. I don't know if I have that option. Otherwise, okay, you I'll, can send I'll send it, it to, to you me. first. Yeah. No problem. And thank you for allowing people to connect with you outside of this webinar. It continues the conversation of this very important topic. So I will um, put her email address in the chat feature for you. Um, and at so as she's typing that, um, I will go ahead and uh, start the conclusion of the webinar. So we want to thank you so much for um, sharing this great information with us and with our uh, participants today. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with our audience, and we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. We hope that you enjoyed this webinar. As a reminder, one week from today, we will email you a link to the evaluation for you to obtain your Nursing Continuing Professional Development Certificate. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars, podcasts, and resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Also, previously recorded webinars and podcasts are freely available on the Sigma repository. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful day.